Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Okay, we have uh, started the recording, Sam, so you can take it away. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, if I just sort of explain who I am, first of all, and um, a little bit about my background, and we'll take it from there, because that will probably help contextualise things. Um, my name's Sam. I'm a fully qualified architect here in the UK. For my sins, I'm, I run the, the architecture courses here at the University for the Creative Arts in Canterbury. Um, so that's the undergraduate um, uh, and, and our postgraduate through to full qualification as an architect if you're in the UK. My background, um, I, I have an interest in a particular area of, of architectural research, which some of you may know comes under the name of, of Space Syntax, who are based largely uh, within UCL um, here in, in the UK, in London. I worked within that, uh, what, what was called the Space Group at the time, for a short while um, as a research associate. And a lot of my research interests, as, as much as I can indulge in them, um, given my other tasks, uh, roll on from that, though I am not, I wouldn't describe myself as purely of the space syntax world. They tend to deal with graph based analysis that looks at generally uh, urban settings and regional settings, although there is some very good work being done by Kirsten Saylor at the scale of buildings and, and, and office layouts and the like. Um, I, I have a slightly different position, which is that I'm interested in this uh, I guess you could call it architectural device called the ISFIST architectural unit, um, which is the, the, the region of space, the geometric shape of space uh, visible from, from any given location in space. So what I do is I use that unit, um, which is a, essentially a visual unit. It's three dimensional, but we generally represent it as a two dimensional slice. I use that to construct advanced analysis of building spaces. It's a, applicable, the techniques are applicable up to the urban scale, um, but my interest is in buildings and that is why the focus is there. Um, that has been something that I've been working on for about 10 years. It's come to a head in the last three where I released a piece of software called the ISFIST app. Um, and I guess if I share screen now, um, that will help. Um, the ISFIST app, which is uh, available for free um, from uh, ISFIST.org is the website. Um, and uh, what you do, uh, you, if you go on here, you can, you can see various blogs by individuals who are using the software. There's a sort of intensive user guide, um, uh, if my internet works, um, which, which should give you all of the basic uh, steps that you need to get going. Um, and you need to log in and download. If, if you create an account, it will allow you to download the software. Um, what I was going to do today was um, just briefly uh, demonstrate the, the software to you, do a sort of live demo. Um, and so just I'm just going to launch straight into it. So um, when you download the software, it'll it'll arrive as a little package. It's designed for use on um, on the Mac. It, it's built on the Mac. Um, it takes advantage of the Retina screen that, that most Macs have nowadays, though it is ported for PC use. It's a standalone application. It doesn't knit into any other software such as BIM, Revit and the like, although there are a whole load of protocols that I've built into it that allow very easy import and export um, to to mesh with sort of advanced um, uh, building modeling systems. And there are companies around the world who are using it in that way. When you launch the software, this is the screen you'll see. I'll show you very briefly in a minute um, how to do import and export. But initially, there's sort of a plan of the Barcelona Pavilion on the screen, and that's because I used that. It's a useful uh, plan to show sort of the basic uh, qualities of the software. So what we can do, um, we can sort of, if you saw there, I clicked over here where it says draw accessible ice fists. Um, and what we can do is we can move the cursor around the plan and it allows us to sort of see which spaces are directly visually linked to, to the position that the cursor is at. 
So that's very useful for sort of a basic level analysis. This this blue shape is what what we call the ice fist at that location. Um, and at a very base level of plan interrogation, it allows you to sort of drop sequential ice fists through the space um, and start to interrogate how individuals' views overlap um, within that space. And so what areas of, of space within, within the uh, building are more or less intensively seen. And that has a whole series on, on the research side, that has a whole series of uh, links and uh, uh, connotations to sort of how we use that space, where we choose to sit, and so on and so forth. Um, but also on the on the applied sort of design front, um, you may wish to sort of for a client or for yourselves internally start to interrogate space and say, okay, so what if we open up here? What links does it create through? Um, there's a few just little tweaks. I'm going to just uh, turn off. Um, some of the some of the lines. So you can also see here that this is just the pure geometries sort of overlapping at given locations. So what we're looking at, if I hit clear, what we're looking at here with the blue, this is space that we can see and we can move directly into. And that's what we call accessible space. So you're looking at the accessible space ice fists here in blue. But we can assign different material qualities to the plan imports as we bring them in. And so one one very simple one is the idea of a sort of an edge that you can see through, but you can't go beyond. So if I move to here, that might be a window, for instance. So the idea of sort of seeing through a window and seeing space beyond there that you can't immediately walk to. Or if I move over to here, it may be sort of the edge of a change in level. It may be in larger buildings, uh, an atrium space. Um, or it may be, uh, as in this case, there's a there's a pond, there's a pool of water down to the left hand side there. And so what we're recording here now is sort of the area of space that is visible and accessible versus the area of space that is is visible, but you can't you can't move into it. And again, that provides sort of useful comparators um, to start to consider um, the consequences of, of the design moves that we make in plan. So this is all pretty basic level analysis um, still. There's a couple of other little tricks that the software can do just at this level. Um, and so what you're looking at here is the lines that are in dark blue in the plan the drawing. They've been assigned as sort of reflective. So it allows us to model the effects of sort of if you add a mirror into space. Um, and the Barcelona Pavilion is quite known for having sort of the whole series of reflective wall finishes that sort of create an illusion of space uh, unfolding beyond that which is which is actually there. Um, so what you're seeing, if I move back down here to where it's rather simpler, um, in red is the space that is made more visible as a result of the reflective surface. And in yellow is sort of the sense of where that space is. Um, so it's it's creating sort of the Alice in Wonderland space beyond the mirror surface. It doesn't actually exist, but the, the viewer moving around this, this building gets a sense of sort of depth at that point. Again, that's, that's I mean, it tends to be that is a relatively esoteric uh, form of analysis. Most of our users tend to just sort of use the basic analysis here. As I said, this is this is sort of entry level stuff. What you can also start to do is you can set an angle to the view. So you can say, I only want to look at this particular view. And that that much, you can relate that much more back to sort of human vision. Um, and so, for instance, you might use it to sort of start to set where people might be seeing um, based on being sitting in different locations in an office. Um, you can also set a horizon line, so you can say, um, I don't want to model vision beyond a certain distance, um, and that allows us again to sort of start to simulate in distance and scale to plans. Or, or you might, for instance, if you were maybe thinking about where security guards um, cover in a museum, you might start to sort of plot those locations through space and get a sense of sort of the coverage that a camera or, or a security person sort of sitting and, and passively monitoring might, might achieve. Um, that, that's it for sort of the, this is what I would call a very initial analysis. Um, and then, then from that, there's, there stems a whole series of increasingly sophisticated um, techniques and tools that the software can do. 
The key point is an isobisk is a geometric shape. So once we've calculated the, the actual visible space and produced that geometric shape, we can extract a whole series of values from it. So if you see in the bottom, bottom left down here, um, we have a whole series of values that are being extracted from this isobisk shape that you see on the screen. So one of those is area, which is a pretty obvious one. Um, it's essentially sort of the size of space that we see at any given point. But then there are a whole series of others that follow on from that, that again are related to the experience that we're having at that location. Things like perimeter, so the amount of uh, edge to your view, or if you go on to some more complex things, there's uh, drift, which is the distance that you are standing from the natural center of gravity of what you can see. Um, and so these things, these, these, uh, they're geometric values, but they describe the way we experience space and therefore have bearing on, on the way we, we may move, we may behave when we're in that space. So we can extract them as what we call point values. So by, just by moving around the ice disk, you can see how those values change. And I'll come back to that in a little while um, because we can use them to, to, to do other analysis too. Before I move on to that, there are two other subsets to the, the ISFIST analysis. Um, so there's, there's this one, which is sort of looking at ISFIST agents. So what we've done here, you can see it's sort of beginning to move on its own. What it's doing is it's at any, every point, it is looking at the space it can see and it's choosing a location at random from that, from that space. And it's then moving towards that for a, a set number of steps. Um, when it's looking at 360 degrees, that doesn't produce very successful movement because it, it's essentially semi-Brownian. It's sort of jittering around a little bit like someone that's had too much coffee. Um, but if you restrict it to something much more like sort of the human cone of vision, what you start to get is meaningful movement through the plan, which is what we call natural movement. It comes from uh, Gibson at all. Um, but uh, that has a surprisingly high correlation to the way humans move and behave and plan. It's not an exact model of, um, it's a sort of model for helping us understand why people might make motivational choices as they circulate in the plan. Um, and we can show sort of the trails of where those, those individuals are going. Or if I hit clear, we can, we can look at them sort of en masse. So this is introducing a hundred agents into the plan at once from a set location and looking at where they move on to an exploring plan. Um, and this is a piece of work that's ongoing. We're, we're developing different motive models for that decision about where to move to. Um, so that will gradually update over time. There's one other, which is the in-between, um, a, a sort of an in-between analysis, which is a regional ISFIST. So what I'm going to do here, here um, so I've selected region ISFIST at the top, and if I click and drag now, it shows me the total area of space that's seen as we move along this pink line. Um, and again, that's a really useful um, way of separating and analysing space. Um, what it can be used for, for instance, if, again, if you think about the security guard principle, Maybe there's someone who's circulating backwards and forwards um, within this plan. And so the blue identifies the region of space that they can see. Another one might be quite often, for instance, uh, carefully planned routes such as that taken by a nurse in a hospital um, and the patients that she will passively monitor, he or she will passively monitor as they move through the wards can be revealed uh, in this way. So that's uh, that's the basic analysis. And as I said, I'm I'm really having to crack on for time because it gets more sophisticated from here on in. Um, we don't just have to think about analysis to any given location, to any given point. What we can do as an interim level is we can draw paths through the space. Um, and so here is me, I'm just drawing a path through the space. And you can see there are two charts appearing on the screen. Now the orange line is the value for area at every given point along this path. Um, I can show you if, if we move the path, if I move the points in the path so we can go back and edit them like this. Um, and that allows, allows sort of a rapid and immediate reconfiguration of, of that analysis. 
Um, we can extend the path as well. If I add more points to it, it just keeps drawing the chart across the screen. So what you're looking at here is area, and it's the value. It, it shows you how the area that you see as you move along this path increases or decreases. Um, that's the orange value. And then the red value is just the distance traveled from the start. So if I move back towards the start, you'll see that the red line drops away again. And again, we can do that. We don't just have to do that for area. We can do that for lots of other values. So I can add in drift um, and you can see how that chart sort of rises and falls. And then occlusivity, which is a really interesting value. I'll, I'll maybe come back to explain what that one is. Um, anyway, there's lots of charts. You can turn them off, on and off. You can export them as an Excel sheet. Um, and again, that can sort of, as we start to design spaces, that can give us a feel for how a user's experience um, changes as, as, as they move through the spaces that we design in an empirical, numeric uh, fashion. So that's been used, for instance, there was a studio at CPT University in, in India where they intensively use this kind of analysis to iterate designs for school. Um, taking a, a, an iteration, bringing that plan into the analysis, running the analysis, learning from it, and, and then going back and reiterating the plan and repeating. Um, you don't just have to do the, this chart is showing the, the experience in numeric form at any given location, but you can also look at how the area seen adds up over time. So this, this is an accumulative chart. So the score of the value for area at every point along the path is, is being added in. It doesn't show much in, in the Barcelona Pavilion because it's a small space, but with more complex spaces, um, that, that can, can be illuminated. The last thing in the path analysis is something called a Minkowski model. So in this, you see there's a three-dimensional shape. And all it's doing, um, it's taking the ice list at every given point along that path is drawing it as a plate, as a layer in that shape, and then it's adding them up over time. So the, the Z axis, the vertical axis here is time, um, and then the X and Y axis describe the plan space experience. Um, so this is, this is an, an, again, an established technique in research fields, but also beginning to be in architectural design fields for sort of starting to quantify and qualify the spatial experiences as you move move through a plan. Um, you can tweak the model, um, you can sort of change the height of it, and you can change the resolution. So here it is produced just by two or three isofists, here it is produced by 300, which gives you a very sort of fine grain um, uh, contouring to, to the thing. Um, I mentioned earlier everything exports. Um, so if I go, for instance, to export file here and I go export raw data, it will give me the option to save a fly file, which is a 3D, I'm sure you can understand it's a 3D printing file, um, which, you know, we've had mixed success producing these through 3D prints, often because of the, the very fine quality of, of the geometry that's being produced. But so it's, it's partly our skill in 3D printing um, being, being critiqued there, I suppose. So that's the what I would call the second level of analysis. It's not sort of super advanced, but it moves us beyond sort of the singular analysis of any given location in space and gives us more of a sort of sense of feel of how this space is going to be as we move through it over time. Um, but the the real the the, the main draw for, of the software for most people um, is what we call the field analysis. So what you can also do beyond looking at a single location is you can calculate the values, say, for something like area for every location within a plan. And then you can assign a spectrum to that. So in this spectrum, uh, purple, blue is low and red is high area. And so what it shows us immediately is a very um, interpretable uh, mapping of the values for area as they rise and fall all the way through this plan. And we can tweak like how we're looking at it. You can you can change the thresholds for, for how that spectrum is applied if you want to focus on particular things. Um, and you can export the data. If I go to export raw data now, I won't do it. 
um, but it gives you the option to save it as a CSV file. So that will export the data values for, for every point in the plan. Um, it's, it doesn't use a graph technique. It uses a, a, a sort of a, what, what I call a stochastic uh, uh, analysis technique. Um, it's, a little bit, it's actually a stochastic estimate. Um, and that allows it to produce very, very, very fine rain uh, grain detail of analysis to a pretty high um, accuracy pretty quickly. And I can show you that happening um, in real time. At the minute, it's running in basic mode. Um, and so in basic mode, there are there are three key analysis available at an ISOVIS level. And then we have the space syntax measures, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, and they are area, uh, vista length, which is simply sort of the length that you can see that is the longest uh, length of view in any given direction, um, and average radial, which is a sense of sort of the average depth of space around you. But if I move up to advanced mode, which will tax the computer a little bit more, but it should be fine. Um, now what you can see is this is the analysis process happening in front of you. So you can see how it runs in real time. Um, it takes a couple of seconds with most plans to produce a meaningful output. Um, an accurate output, but, but it, it pretty quickly reaches a stability. Um, I can maybe say a bit more about that in the questions if, if they come up. Um, the key thing to look for is in the top menu up here, you want to look at how many sample cycles have happened. So what we're doing at the minute is what I would call a local analysis. We're just looking at the experiential phenomena at, a, at locations in plan. So that's sort of, if you go to this point, you will experience large area. And so for that to be accurate, we want it to be around about five local cycles. So you can see up here, hopefully you can make it out. Um, it's saying 8.5. So it's well past the point of um, sort of statistical uh, uh, stability there. Though you may see some visual change, but that's because our eyes are very attuned. Um, and then we have a whole series of measures that then follow on once we're in, in the advanced system. Um, so you might want to look at perimeter, so how the, 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 the size of the edge of your view changes as you move through plan. A key one is compactness. So this takes the space that you see and compares it to a circle. Um, and when it is an exact circle, you have a compactness value of one. When it is a very disparate star shape, you'd have a very, very low compactness value. And so that shows um, us where you get discrete regions of space. So, for instance, in this plan, you can see there are some, some areas that are sort of solid red. And there are some areas that are green and there are some areas that are blue. So if you stay within a green area and you don't cross over the boundary into another colour, that means that your experience in there is, is largely constant. So your, your spatial experience is not rapidly changing. When you step over one of those edges and you move, say, from red to green or from, from green to yellow or, or, or going the other way into a blue, that, that, is, that uh, is caused by the shape of your view rapidly changing at that point. And so therefore your experiential uh, experience is, is changing too. So you're sort of moving from one type of space into another. So that's a really useful measure. Again, if I pull it up and down, you can see that there are modulations of it. You can see these boundaries in space that run through. Um, they, if you're read up on this, there's a, a publication by John Proponis, um, which talks about the shape of architectural space and edges within it that define regions of experience. And this conforms with that. Uh, one other one that's really worth mentioning at this point in terms of local field measures is occlusivity. Now, occlusivity is a really key one. It was first defined by Michael Benedict in a paper in 1979. What it records here is um, if you imagine yourself looking out of a window compared to being in a completely sealed room, in a completely sealed room that's square, all of the edges of your view are closed by walls. If you introduce a window to that and you look out that window, then at least one of the edges of your view as you look out the window is going to be open. So as you move, that edge will also move and it will reveal more space. So occlusivity records how much of, your, of the edges of your view are meaningfully open edges that may, may reveal more space as you move. And so what it does is it highlights locations in the plan 
where you have sort of again changing fields of view where where as you come round a corner or as you stand behind a column um your view is sort of able to rapidly change it's uh it's the kind of space that if you're a child in running around the plan you, you may choose to go to to sort of play hide and seek um it's also the kind of space that more meaningfully are places where we're having to make decisions about which way we want to go in plan um, again, you can sort of tweak the thresholds here to get different sort of different sort of upper and lower limits for what you want to interrogate. What it tends to pick out are sort of extended thresholds, extended walls. You can see the effect of how sort of tectonic moves in plan modulate the space beyond um, and therefore people's behavior as, as they move through that space. So, so far I've covered local measures. Um, I'll just show you drift. Drift, remember, is the distance from your the center, of, the center of gravity of the space that you are seeing. Um, and so that sort of gives you a natural sense of being drawn through a plan. The areas here that are purple are sort of low drift, so that's where you're very close to the center of gravity of your view. And those are the spaces that we, we, we naturally tend to gravitate towards as humans. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let that one be for now because I'm running out of time, he says, looking at the clock. Um, so very quickly onto the space syntax measures. Again, there's a whole suite. Anyone who, who's familiar with the space syntax world will know that their primary measure is integration. Um, but I'm just going to first show you there's a couple of things that lead us towards that. So there is this analysis that we can conduct, which I hope you saw, I click there, I'll click again. Um, this records the number of visual steps from any location to any other location in plan. So the, the, I clicked up here where the black dot was, everything in red is the first isovist, the, the, what you can immediately see from that point. Everything is yellow is what you can see from the red, everything is green is what you can see from the yellow, and so on and so on all the way through the plan. So what we can see to get to the furthest point in this plan is one, two, three, four, five visual steps. So the purple down here. Um, and that allows us to sort of interrogate across the whole of the plan how space is structured um, in a relative manner. You know, so some some spaces are more connected to other spaces than than others. The, the remote spaces tend to be low, the, the more central spaces tend to be high. And what we can do is we can accumulate that analysis over time to generate a mapping called mean visual depth. So here you see it. Um, and in this, um, if I just tweak the spectrum just to just to draw it out, um, the area here that you see that is uh, in purple is the space that is most connected on average to all other spaces in the plan. So it's a useful um, central space that is is absolutely key in how we navigate and explore space um, that relates to how we build navigational maps in our brain but also sort of naturally which spaces we're more likely to find our way to in a plan whereas if I pull the spectrum the other way you can see there are some spaces up here that are in red so those are the ones that on average it takes a lot of lot of visual steps to get to so those are the remote spaces that people are less likely to visit. And this has really critical implications for how we design, for instance, office layouts, but also beyond into city and, 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 and other structures. Um, and then lastly, from that, we can generate integration, which is the big space syntax measure that uh, I know a fair bit about. I, I won't go on about it because uh, I'm sure there are other people perhaps in the audience who are far more uh, advanced in understanding, but it may come up again also perhaps in discussion at the end. So that's the field measures. There's a whole series of others. There's things like control. Control identifies spatial locations from which you, you are having to make a decision about moving to other locations. So for instance, from this point up here, we can see down into this space, into this space, into this space, and over into this space over here that none of those spaces can see each other at this in this analysis. So that's a that's a position of control from where you may move on to sort of travel into other spaces. Uh, there's lots of different things that we can do using these fields. We can export the data, we can look at them as 3D landscapes and sort of spin them around. 
Um, you can change the color factors and you can overlay. Um, you can overlay various different, uh, for instance, flow vectors showing you the direction of the field at any given location. Um, but again, I, I, I could go on for hours. Um, I'm going to show you one last thing. So the most sophisticated level of the analysis then takes those field values um, and plots them um, in, in a chart space against one another. So what you're looking at here is around about 500,000 points taken from those plans, all of which have had these measures calculated against themselves. Um, and then there are two controls being uh, two, two uh, metrics, two, two values being compared against each other here for every point. So we're comparing control to compactness at this point in, in this view. Um, and what we can do is we can, you know, it, it's rare that you get a direct correlation, but what you do is you get clumps of space. For instance, this one here that I've just selected in, in purple. Um, and we can say, OK, so what's what's going on there at that location? Um, and we can look at that in, in 2D plan and you see it, it defines discrete architectural um, spaces. Um, and that is also a piece of ongoing uh, research, I suppose, um, looking at how we describe architectural space from a point of view of experiential and configurational uh, uh, empirical analysis. Um, and I think there is a there is probably an underlying vocabulary of uh, metric there. That would allow us to describe space in, in the way in, in sort of numeric factors that machine learning systems would understand and um, that's a sort of finishing point i've not mentioned import and export so i'll just show you really briefly it's really quick it's really easy it's it's optimized to allow uh, import from for instance dwg dxf um, or I do a lot of work with undergraduate students, so it was also able to take in SVGs that would be worked up through Illustrator. I just, I mean, it, it can it can cope with city plans. Probably best not to go too large with city plans, but it could. It, it's designed for reasonably complex buildings, and I'm just trying to pick one. Um, I don't know. Pick a pick a building, anyone. Um, Hey, what should we do? Uh, I suppose we're in black back. Um, let's, let's go for this one here. Um, so the import process, there's a brief period of sort of waiting for the plan. The, the software takes the plan in the form that you've given it, analyzes it, looks for different material assignments that you may have made. Um, cleans the plan up a bit so that we have a nice sharp analysis uh, that's produced and then it just gets to work. You don't need, you very often don't need to tell it what to do. Um, as you can see there, it's, it's busy calculating the fields, fields in the background. If we say we didn't want to look at the fields, if we just wanted to move, move a nice fist around in plan, that's, that's also doable. I think that's my, is that my half hour? I, I suspect so. Everything is gone ominously quiet. I hope I'm still broadcasting. Yes, sir, um, we can hear you. So was, I, I, yes, I think that's I've 30 minutes. Up now, yeah. 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 Um, and so, yeah, I, I can open it up to questions. Um, it was a bit of a whistle stop tour, but I'd be very happy to, to go into more detail or demonstrate something for people if, if they really want. Okay, any questions from um, the floor or the web? <laughs> I, I could lead off. I mean, often people ask about data export and and linking, for instance, to to something like Revit. Um, we've looked at it, but I mean, the the techniques that this software uses is sort of advanced. Uh, it, it does a lot of work with the GPU, um, mm -hmm. and so it's better as a standalone software. But the protocols for importing stuff in and out, it's very easy to develop them. So um, there, there was a company called Space Lab that they've actually just changed their name. They're called um, We Are We Are the Lab or something nowadays, um, and they've they've done quite a bit of work at looking at building in little 
little bolt-ons to things like Revit that, that pre-produce the plans for them. Um, and that's very doable. Um, and so then we have quite a strong workflow that stuff can come out into the software, run the analysis, produce the kind of um, either visuals for a client or uh, analysis for the design team to then consider that goes to a point of review and, and then the work sort of feeds back in, um, in into the workflow there. It can also produce data. So I mentioned that the export is CSV and it's very, very easy to then bring that kind of data into a package such as GIS or, or the like. Um, there was a question about what kinds of file. Um, yeah, so it, it works with, with 2D plan or section information. Um, that's just the nature of the system, the analysis. We're we're looking at doing a 3D system, but but the computers aren't powerful enough yet to do that properly. Um, so the the um, the file import type is DWG DXF. So uh, working from from AutoCAD standards, um, and that can deal with pretty much any curve um, or cell. Um, it, it, it's compatible to all that kind of stuff. Or if you don't have AutoCAD, then the SVG, that's uh, the SVG format is an open format, scalable vector graphic format. And so actually is quite widely used in, in other software approaches. Um, so the standard for that would be a, an Illustrator file that's saved in, as an SVG. But either really, um, if you want to assign different materials, I mean, the instructions for that are all in the user manual, but you simply do it by setting the materials to different layers. Um, there was a question, Jerry said, no ceiling. I mean, you, you could do a ceiling plan. Um, the, the point is it's based on cuts through a building. So as a, as a standard approach, an architectural approach, this tends to be working on a plan cut and on section cut uh, and working smart across those formats um, but either can be either can be brought into the system like that great that's good i mean um any um any more um questions for sam I think um, there is also a link, a survey link, if I'm not wrong, in the uh, web, the meeting chat that um, hopefully the participants can actually um, click on that so that you we wanted to get some um, findings on AI. OK, uh, before you leave, please, um, please uh, access that. And Sam, I think this is actually a very interesting um, sharing on the spatial analysis. And um, yeah, I'm quite intrigued by, you know, you have all these legends using colors and things like that. So, you know, um, especially the part where, you know, this, uh, the red actually, you see the yellow, yellow, we'll see the blue, that kind of thing. So yeah, those, yeah, yeah. those are really, really good. I mean, it's, um, it makes things simpler somehow. Yeah, it's, it's. You know, some of this is intuitive knowledge, but some of it is also about drawing out that in a more visual way. And yeah. some of it is about sort of stuff that's maybe a bit counterintuitive, starting to identify those regions of space that you wouldn't normally wouldn't normally think about. Um, we have, you know, within the school here, we have a little sort of set of workshops and mm. seminars that go around it. So actually developing the, the in-depth knowledge about what all these fields do um it's is quite a task in itself that sure. uh, you know that there, there is that teaching available mm. um, and yep. on on the website i do try with all of the measures that i've shown there's a little definition it would take me forever to go through them all but there's a little definition on the website in the user guides so you can start from there um, and speculate i guess a little about how you might wish to to employ or deploy mm. them within your own analysis Sure. I think the link to the website uh, you have given as well, right? isovis.org. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Sure. Can. So yeah. um, this this link, I mean, this recording web, uh, webinar link is recorded. So um, it will be posted onto um, our competition website and also at this computation.space website, um, mm -hmm. where um, a lot of the BEAM uh, webinars and seminars are held there. So mm -hmm. yeah, I will send you the link once it's up. And then you can you can view it. Yep. 
Okay, right. th thank you, Sam, for, for the for this wonderful sharing and taking your time off um, your busy schedule. I think you have to go back to school now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, back to it's the end of the year here, the end of the academic year, so it's mayhem. Oh, okay. Very, very right, busy. Right. Okay, can do. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Sam. All right. Okay, so the rest, um, just try to finish up the, I mean, click on the, the form, the survey, the link, and then um, thank you for attending. Um, this recording will be uh, posted on the IBDC 2021 website and also competition.space. So um, keep a lookout for the recording links in there. Uh, for the rest of the, for the other speakers, Pat, uh, Professor Patrick Jensen and Dr. Yeo, um, thank you for taking time to support this event and your sharing sh uh, session as well. Thank you very much. It was great to participate. All right. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Yeo, as well. My pleasure. My pleasure. Okay. All right. So for the rest, uh, do keep a lookout for our um, on upcoming um, webinars. Um, there's one, I think, early June. Um, on the 2nd of June. So details will be out soon. Just keep a lookout in our website. All right. Thank you. Have a good evening, everyone.